Welcome to episode five of the IQ Business AI Lab podcast. I'm Tim Mattis, your co-host, along with Josh Chetter. Today, we are talking to Dean Furman. Very excited to have Dean with us today. He is a innovator and an expert in the AI world, the founder of a business called 1064 Degrees, the author of an acclaimed book called Exponential Potential, and also the inventor of a game called The Dawn of Disruption. Dean has spent many years both in and out of corporates in South Africa, um, some financial services and others. But Dean, wonderful to have you in the studio. Can I hand over to you just to tell us a little bit more about you before we introduce today's topic? Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks to Tim and Josh. Yeah, so I started my career as an actuary. I worked at Discovery, but uh, while the actuarial stuff didn't excite me too much, I was always good at innovation. I won two of the annual top prize for innovation from any actuary in the group. I entered twice, won it twice. Then I went across to Alexander Forbes, headed up innovation and product development for the group at a stage. And then I, and then 2015 to 2017, together with uh, Edward Kieswetter, who's the SARS boss at the moment, has headed up a separate entity called Interruption Holders, focused on uh, disruption and a lot of digital disruption for financial service businesses. And since 2017, launched my business to, uh, 1064 degrees or 1064 degrees, um, together with my co-founder, Mark Furman, and we focus on everything innovation, primarily focus on digital innovation. And uh, within that, you really, really focus a lot on AI innovation. And as you said uh, along the way, to write a book uh, that's uh, that uh, that sold all in all the stores and created something called Dawn of Disruption, which is a game-based innovation session using a board game that it created that's now being played in, in, in like, uh, around five different countries uh, with people running it and I'm sure there's a whole lot more but I guess we could get stuck into it. That's great Dean, thanks so much. It's really great to have you here and I believe that we have a, um, a you have many connections with other IQers and we're hoping that we're going to do a lot more uh, thinking and working together in the future. Really what we're going to do today is just bounce around between the three of us on the topic of the three do's and don'ts of AI adoption in enterprises and to share our opinions and maybe challenge each other's thoughts a little bit. I'm happy to go with my first, I thought about my three do's and I thought the ones that came to me first would be the ones that I should mention. I think the first do in adopting artificial intelligence is pretty basic. I think that organizations should be very careful and clear about setting up structures to drive adoption in the business. That to me is kind of the number one, the number one do, making sure that this isn't something that gets neglected in the organization. I think a lot of businesses at the moment are contemplating AI. They understand kind of academically or but more than academically that this is going to be a really big thing, but not to organize it, not to address organizational structure in a way that's meaningful and actually forces the organization to um to respond would be to me. Um, it would both be the biggest failure not to do it, but the number one do. So that's my first do. I don't know. Thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, uh, with that, definitely the structure is very important. I think even before that, there's one step where I just believe that at the moment, and it's been so for the last few years, but way more in the last year, was to actually get, be confident as an organization, as leaders or key people within a business, knowing what's possible. Because right now, if you had to say to people, okay, what's AI? There's this, there's that, there's this, the chat GPT, there's uh, image recognition, there's uh, using our own data for, you know, to make better decision-making, there's this, there's that, there's 50,000 apps, there's so much there. I just feel like people having confidence to know what is this beyond the airy-fairy high level and being able to know we know what is possible with AI? I think you need to have a leadership that, especially on key the aspiring leaders and decision makers, that can say what is possible with AI and have a very clear view to know, okay, we know what is happening in the world of AI so that you can actually start really bringing your company uh, and leading your company uh, going forward. I've still seen that. It may be surprising to some, but, because, but still, people know all the buzzwords, uh, etc. but... Still, I don't feel like most most leaders can effectively can effectively know, uh, with confidence say that they truly get this world of AR. 
So, I mean, I think you're describing a world where you need to have enough knowledge to understand what your AI strategy is, and then that's what's going to be really important because the structure will obviously be there to support ultimately what that what that strategy is. I think I, I agree. I agree completely. And I think that the, the one of the challenges that organizations have at the moment is that although they're hearing all the noise and some people are going to some of the conferences and stuff, you know, the reality, this this age old challenge of corporate inertia just gets in the way. People are doing things the way that they've always done it and they're busy and they're chasing targets and sometimes don't even have the space available to, you know, give this the kind of attention that it needs. And also it's such a rapidly developing space. I mean, we we a year into the launch of the, you know, the public launch of the first large language models. And where we are today and probably tomorrow after open AI fully announces kind of its latest changes. Just we're in a different world to where we were 11 months ago. And that's tricky because businesses struggle to change and adapt fast. And you've got this incredibly rapidly evolving uh, kind of substrate. Josh, what was your first two? We've got we've got uh, strategy, we've got structure. What's yours? Yeah. So uh, I'll get I'll get on that in a second. I just wanted to just maybe add to what was what was said on on, on the sort of idea of uh, structure as one of the places to look at for um, or when implementing um, an AI strategy. And I think there's many factors that can impact what that structure should be. I think broadly speaking, there's you know I mean a, a sort of decentralized structure on one end of the spectrum and a centralized structure on the other end, where a centralized structure will essentially entails creating a, a sort of a dedicated AI unit that's a sense of excellence and that uh, sort of for lack of a better term owns sort of uh, development and governance etc and then on the other end of the spectrum it's sort of embed within business units AI uh, um, sort of decisions AI decision makers and expert and experts relative to those specific domains and I think obviously there's different things to consider as well you mentioned corporate inertia uh, also I mean part of that is obviously mm -hmm. uh, um, culture of, of an organization and how they have established ways of doing things, the size of the organization, obviously. So I just want to add to that. I totally agree. I think uh, to get onto your question, what my first do was, that was to essentially not assume that, I guess it's sort of mirrored with a don't, and that is to assume that your organization is AI ready solely because of executive buy-in. I think um, it is possible. That's a very important thing to have. Of course, you can't proceed without executive buy-in. But when it comes to AI readiness, I think it's also valuable to take a bottom up approach to look at what is the sort of baseline data maturity and data knowledge or data literacy, I guess, if you will, of people at various levels of an organization's structure from those who are client facing and operations to um, analytics, then leading up to the executive level to, to really um, take, a, take a look at um, their sort of data literacy and what they understand of as being required to. Yeah, so I guess that's. In a nutshell, what my first do is, I'm not sure if there's any thoughts. It sounds like you're saying it might be worthwhile almost doing some sort of assessment, readiness assessment from organization. And I mean, I'm hearing you say data, but I imagine there could be many other dimensions as well. Data literacy is probably not the only thing that you cry in an organization. It may not be the only predictor of success of adoption in an organization. But is that what you're saying? You almost need to sort yeah. of benchmark the business's readiness to embrace this. And, and then that might give you a bit of a map as to how best structure and, and uh, go from there. Precisely. Yeah. So, I mean, back to your previous points, it's interesting to hear you saying is that you see this as almost like a bipolar model where on the one side, you've got like really embedded structures that embrace AI and the other, you've got kind of federated. So this is like something that becomes innate in the structures of the business versus the other side where you've got kind of a central core that leads, sets, sets the policy framing, possibly some of the actual application development things. But I mean, is that not potentially a, a timeline? Maybe you start central to build up like central competence in the organization and over time as the organization is able to really build this into their way of work and, you know, continuously being innovative and Dean would be super to hear your thoughts because I think so much of this touches on innovation and the ability to rapidly innovate. But maybe you need that central structure in the beginning, led by the CEO, because I think you need to have that executive buy-in. And then over time, once you've got sort of a critical mass of skills and an operating model around how you take learners in that central core and kind of create communities of interest internally and kind of up capacitate teams that matures out to one that's kind of more federated. Could, do you think that's right? Or do you think it's sort of one or the other model? How, how, how do you see that? No, I think it's right. I think there's combinations and there's different types of knowledge that different people need to have. So like almost, I think, uh, three categories, uh, come to think of it. So 
One category is your your core technical AR skills. That's your data scientists, your certain people within your IT team. There's real deep core AR skills that that could be needed unless you a business that partners with a company that does that for you. So you need to have access in one way or another for people that have those skills to be able to build things that you need. And the next two are, I'll break it up into almost like Day-to-day -day AR effectiveness and productivity. So that's like using things like generative AI, the chat GPTs, et cetera. What is your day-to-day -day AR tools this kit and have the workforce that's used to utilizing AI to the best of its effectiveness? And then there's another one where it's not just the day-to-day -day effectiveness, but like the what next for a business. That's the understanding the knowledge of what is possible with AI. Yeah. And and enough to know what's possible and who key providers of technology are, et cetera, like that. Because with that knowledge, then you can start creating the future. And and I would feel like a lot of businesses now, I think it's quite right that within each core function within a business, also have your leaders. So even if your AR champion, so even within your support functions, AR, I mean, HR, marketing, legal, et cetera, et cetera, to have people that are driving the gender, because it's not... What I found typically with businesses in innovation in general, but uh, AI even more particularly, is that companies are pretty good at their core business work out, okay, how to apply AI for that or to that. But then there's all these other key areas of the business, which isn't around their core solution or product or service, that some companies are very advanced in their core business of what they do, but all the support functions is like, you know, archaic which doesn't help mm. catapulting your your business forward. You need the full ambit of everything within your business to do that. So I definitely think you need to either partner or people within your organization that has core you know, data science ability and to actually work with your data. Then you've got the, your key decision makers and those guiding the future of where your business is going to understand, the, be confident in understanding uh, what is possible and how to get a company there. And then you've got every single person in your organization having to know uh, in their own environment what's the key AR tools that they should be using and how to use them effectively. It's a it's a fascinating conversation because it always becomes inescapable to me that there's like one of two paths, and I suppose like something in the middle. But we're talking about, like, you know, you're talking about the support functions in business, so everything that keeps the business running and how you know, in support of its core offerings. So I'm a business that makes Acme widgets, but you know, all of the invoicing, all of the HR management, all of the client relationship management, even the services around production and supply chain, all of these things now can be in some ways probably touched by AI. So the business of doing business rather than kind of like the product that you're trying to produce. But either way, one of two things happens. We either unleash this new supercharging could toolkit onto a workforce and the workforce is able to be exponentially more efficient with the same number of people. Now that assumes the market can support an exponential increase in the number of Acme widgets out into the market. It's not reached the saturation and the market will bump it up. Or else the other thing happens, which is that organizations don't need as many people. And I think it's a it's a it's a really interesting thing to start to think about. And when I spoke about when I thought of what my three do's were, my second do was around this it's like how do you create the right internal perspectives and incentives to deal with the transition bearing in mind that a lot of people are going to feel threatened so you might have people sitting in internal functions saying well i can actually build something here to you know run a, what was otherwise a human process that was quite manual and but that's my process that's the thing that i do so i don't know what are your guys thoughts on that i mean is this a are we asking some people to make themselves by embracing ai on the one hand, to make themselves more efficient, but is there not also the threat of what that might mean for the very people? And is that not a barrier to adoption? If I can maybe take a first stab there, Dean. I think I had some of these experiences in the machine learning space. I was building machine learning models that were intended to augment certain operational efficiencies like lead scoring and retentions and, and collections, et cetera, using just your, your sort of basic machine learning ranking algorithms. And sort of the challenge I did experience there was exactly how you describe it, the sort of buy-in from stakeholders who are in the operations of these that do understand the sort of efficiencies these models or, or, or algorithms bring, but ultimately feel like they're, you're trying to replace them essentially because of uh, um, the fact that they aren't um, as involved in this 
uh, in the scoping or creation of the solution. And I sort of learned that the hard way and the one way I've learned to compensate that is to, to, to take them along on that on the journey. So if you're building a product that uses AI and the loop to, to uh, um, uh, bring about some operational eff efficiency, there's a lot that there's, there's many ways that those people can get involved in from the design perspective of fully understanding what the problem is, how it should be developed, sort of risks involved, uh, uh, future potentials for, for for improvement and the rest. And I think they can become valuable users that can also become scorers of the system. So especially when it comes to, I would say even there's even a greater need when it comes to generative AI than in machine learning to have a random sample of human evaluations done in some way on the generated output. And these people in the operations team can become involved as uh, sort of uh, within that pipeline of evaluation of AI. And so that they feel part of the solution, they feel that you're not there necessarily just to, to replace them. So just in, in short, to bring them on the journey um, when you develop these solutions, that would be, I would say one thing I, I, I would uh, bring to the, to the table there differently, uh, learning from my own past mistakes. <laughs> It's brilliant. If I could add to that, I think it's very much depends on the company culture. Some companies don't even have to worry about it. They know they've got a culture where it's very people first and they actually feel that they belong and, the, and you know, the company is not looking to oust them in any way. And then, you know, I feel that that's a much more fertile environment for this, this to happen. Other companies, they know that the company isn't really people first and they're people first and actually would at the turn of a hat, be happy to get rid of them. And have already gone through all different restructurings where people have just been got rid of there, those companies are very hot. So I don't think it's the same for every single company. But one thing that that would definitely have to say is that you need to give people some guidance of what it might look like for you when this perfect state is reached. So you want to say to people, do you know what, you've got the AR programs, and this and they can see they're not stupid they can see look this potentially can replace exactly what i do you got to have that career development path with the person to be like okay if this does happen you know where you can add value is x y and z and it depends it's, it's, it's not in, in a box you can't say oh these type of people will do this type of thing it's very individualized a certain person it has good leadership ability. Another person has uh, good, uh, you know, core technical skills. The one's got good project management, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to make people feel safe. Do you know what? There's still a place for you here. And you got to work with your people. And that's uh, especially where you've got a clear professional development plan with them to be like, okay, this is the future, but where does it mean for you in the future? And not just tell him where it might be. Like, how can we support you then? Because you may need to upskill them. Then. Their current role is going to be redundant. How can we help you as an organization to get to a point where you're not redundant? And that whole thing going back to that, people won't get be disrupted. Job roles will be disrupted. So, but and the only people will be disrupted if they're not willing to embrace doing new things and to learning and and that. I think it's actually a bit unfair on companies. Sorry if I'm taking too long with my <laughs> component here, but uh, it's quite unfair on companies. On. So I know with so many companies that I go into and I respect the wishes of the company and you know it's the brief and I do as they say, but they're like, don't frighten anyone. Don't say to them there could be any job losses. Don't say there could be any disruption. So make to say to them that this will create more opportunities and a whole thing. But I do think that in a way you can't scare people but you have to balance it with making people aware of the urgency to to make keep make sure that you're relevant for the future it's the same as saying to someone no someone's a smoker just don't tell them that it could be dangerous because you know we don't want to scare them of the potential dangers of the harm that it could be done for them that's in the short term you're doing them a service in the long term you're doing them a big disservice so again if you're not making people aware that these things potentially in time will be able to take over a lot of your job role you're not giving them the opportunity to and the awareness that they need to do something about it yeah i think that's i think that's 100 percent right and i think that people are people as you said earlier aren't stupid they're going to work you know connect two and two I mean, you've, you've said a lot of really interesting stuff. So to go in saying that nothing's going to happen when it's patently obvious that it will would be very counterculture. And I think it'd be very damaging on its own. So you want to avoid that. Yes, that is the prevailing message amongst, like, say, especially keynote speakers. So the thing is, like, you get brought in for a conference and it's an AI conference and everyone wants to be like the, the line that they all say. 
And yeah. I do, I, I do pretty much. I think more uh, AI keynotes than anyone. But uh, having listened to what other people have to say, everyone's like, it will create more jobs than yeah. than that. Nonsense. The definition of AI is now technology that could do things typically done by humans. How can there be a technology that's now doing things typically done by humans that will create more opportunities and and, and things for humans? It will create, I think, better opportunities in terms of the type of work that can be done by humans is something that humans would want to do rather than things that, you know, are really day in, day out, um, you know, repetitive, yeah. mundane labor. So I think it's it's opening up for humans that, but the only people that are going to actually be able to take advantage of this are ones that make sure that they have the relevant skills to be able to thrive in that type of environment. And I do think that it's going to be difficult for some people, and I do think that it doesn't serve anyone to completely mask that. I think there needs to be a balance between, of course, it will create new opportunities, but only the the opportunities are there for those that are ready to prepare for that. It's interesting to hear you say that they the main message in that's going out is this one that, I mean, it's that, it's that adage that says you won't be replaced by an AI, you'll be replaced by a human with an AI. And it kind of implies a one-to-one -one yeah. matching of the better person yeah. is going to replace you. And I'm 100% in the camp that says that that's not true and we need to be careful of it. There's, as you say, and what we're building here is it's it's the industrialization of the human mind. And with that, machines will do what human minds did and they will face all of the, we will be faced with all of the efficiency advantages that you get from silica. So the fact that you can build these things in a, you know, Moore's law in terms of number of transistors, the production effects that we're getting in all of the fabrication that's going into building GPUs. And there's just no reason to expect that this is not going to be disruptive to thinking jobs that people have and i think it's important yeah. to start there because what it actually does is rather than saying nothing bad's going to happen except to the couple of lazy people who don't embrace ai is it forces organizations to think much more carefully about what their future does look like and as you were describing kind of growth paths and really what you were saying is you need to have a future state for your business you need to understand what your business is going to look like in a disrupted market in five years time when new entrants in the market don't have any of their legacy corporate inertia that you have. They've built in low code, no code environments using the latest mm -hmm. tools, people who are embracing this stuff and they will be leaner, more efficient organizations. Of that, there can be no mistake. And that trend's not changed. The fact that leaner, more efficient organizations eventually dislodge businesses that have become slow and unable to, res to, to respond is a trend that's been around since businesses have been around. Now we've just seen an acceleration of that. But I think that candidacy around what's happening and the fact that there will be changes is important. It's a conversation possibly for the podcast on its own, but you were talking about people may not do, you know, there may be kind of the discretion around what jobs you want thinkers to do. Maybe thinkers will do different type of jobs to the ones that are more, more mm -hmm. menial and, and kind of rote. The other option is that there will be an abundance of sorts that comes out from AI, which is not matched in the same way one-to-one -one with the people who produce the abundance. So in the past, you had X number of people in the in this in the system producing widgets and creating the economic value. And the beneficiaries of that were very often the people doing the work. Now you have a situation where cast your mind five years ahead, you may have the same abundance. You still got the same stuff being done in the environment, in the in the in the economy. Maybe you've got more stuff being done. And that's still creating the same economic value, but it's going to flow differently. It may now flow into fewer organizations. I'm very mindful of the fact that if there's ever been the dawn of an opportunity for sort of a universal basic income, this is it. This is the time when in the next little while, as we industrialize thinking jobs, the excess, the, the amount of value that still flows into the system is going to need to be redistributed in a different way. And we're going to have to think very carefully about that. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a fascinating, I think it's a fascinating time. Just connected to this, um, in terms of uh, we talk about concerns and fears among those potentially at the the risk of, if not replacement, and certainly um, uh, sort of a disruption uh, from from AI. And I think it sort of links into my to another item on my list in terms of the uh, I don't and associated do not to be frozen with fear, specifically with regard to data privacy, residency, et cetera. I know that, and I have to be, have to be very clear when I say that, it, it, I don't mean ignore these things, of course. Those are very, very important things, specifically because of uh, um, Poppy and the whole range of the, uh, other related laws, GDPR overseas, et cetera. 
But I've heard a lot in person and online, a lot of misinformation, uh, to put it bluntly, around what OpenAI does and does not do with your data when you use it. And I think that it, it almost becomes a non-starter, a non-starter when you bring up AI, when people will say, no, it's uh, your, your data is going to become uh, a sort of public, uh, public knowledge or something like that. And so I think um, that's something I, I really caution against. I think understand the landscape, understand the technical sort of differentiations which are you know what i mean or how, it comes down to how do you access these services is it through an api or is it through the front end tool because the api is a lot more secure it's, uh, uh, for example versus your web browser which is using a uh, sort of the front end interface and and most use cases at scale are going to be using a sort of pipeline that's going to be involved that's going to be that's going to involve apis and cloud etc it's very unlikely you're going to build a robust Sort of pipeline of or product just over on top of the front end the sort of user interface which is uh, still useful for for a lot of co-pilot sort of use cases yeah so i think that there's, there's, it's very easy to become frozen with fear with regard to data privacy and residency when other competitors who understand the sort of nuances there are already starting to uh, tackle some of the low-hanging fruit that um, um, that is out there so can I be a little bit more polemical and say don't be paralyzed with the comp with the ignorance maybe is the right thing rather than with fear uh, lower yes. that. And I, I mean, I think maybe we sort of touch in here on a common misperception, which is this idea that as you chat with these chatbots, you somehow kind of change in the corpus. You know, if like I update the sensitive bit of information in my question, somehow that's going to update the corpus and the model's going to learn from it. And that's a, I mean, that's like, that's a common misnomer. That's just not how it works. You're not reweighting the model. You're not doing, you're not updating the vet. You're not doing anything like that. You just, um, putting in an input and getting out a prediction of the next outputs that are going to happen. So I, mean, I agree with you. I think that's really important. And I've got a, I've got a don't that's linked to yours. So don't be paralyzed with fear. But my don't is also don't build like crazy. And I think this is a, it's another caution because the rate of development. I mean, you can an organization can go nuts and start building all sorts of things with the tools that we've got at the moment and. Every week, as you watch this ecosystem explode, you discover that there's a niche startup somewhere in the world that has dedicated its entire reason for being into that one business problem that you're trying to solve. And they've done it a thousand times better than you have. So there's a kind of a fine art at the moment around not moving and moving too fast and just knowing. And I think it goes back to knowing what your business is about. What are you actually trying to do? That strategy that Dean was kind of leaning towards earlier, because as much as you can do nothing, you can also do things that are completely wasted because this ecosystem is just exploding. And I think the announcement tomorrow at OpenAI is going to show us some of that. So kind of a, a small example, like building a chatbot for your business, depending on how you do that. That's just a just a senseless exercise because those things are just going to be a dime a dozen off the shelf, better than anything you can build coming out of the main uh, big tech companies in the next in the coming weeks and months. I want to comment on this as well as the last thing that you said. I think that so I'll start just with the one thing that you were telling. I've seen companies have been more bringing more lawyers in to advise them than they have anyone else. And, and, and a lot of them, some are really good. Some lawyers actually, they don't actually understand how the technology works. I've been, there's been different, I've, I've been exposed because I'm on a lot of these panels, et cetera. Some of the big firms they actually don't understand how the technology works. Like, I'm not going to mention any names, but it's like frick. The amount they're charging companies to to advise on something they have absolutely no idea about, it's ridiculous. Others are actually very good. So one is make sure if you have someone advising you that they actually know what they're talking about. Second thing is that the biggest risk, okay, fine. So everyone's putting risk first, but, which is very important to understand the risk, but as long as one of the risks you put on the table is the risk of actually moving too slow in this area. So, and not doing anything because there, I feel, I do feel that the amount of lost effectiveness and productivity, if you monetize that from not doing something and not getting your people really flying with a lot of just the simple generative AI, especially generative AI, that they can far exceeds any amount of downside risk you can have from, from other risks of something else. Um, going within the phone. The amount of time people are it's, it's focusing on things like, oh, but some of the results might be biased towards this one or that might be, which we haven't seen why or where or how, but we've been read an article, there might be bias potential. And then you have to try to find a use case that there could have even been that. Obviously, you don't want anything to do that. Or, no, you know what? One of our competitors could find out something about us. But what about one of your uh, 
competitors are pricing all the technology and you're not, and then suddenly they can uh, be way, way, way more effective than you deliver things in a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost, do it better. Like that's a bigger risk than anything else. Of course, you don't want any bias against any person, but uh, you know, it's it's a case of what's the realistic risk? The realistic risk that that doesn't actually come into play that often with any of these models. It does in like really one to the blue moon in certain situations. Um, the, now going on to your your next point, when when you were talking about, uh, you said your don'ts don't build um, too 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 quickly. I think that, and you touched on it in one of the sentences that you said, but I think there's not a risk if you're not going willy-nilly. You have to understand what is your business strategy, what is it that your business does, and what you're able to achieve, and also not saying what does the business do in terms of the service that you offer. It's one of those hammer and nail stories, you know. Uh, your business isn't there to make the whole. It's not there, you know, are you a hammer salesman, you know. It's not that typical thing. Is what is the value that you give to clients? Sorry, that's my dog in the background. Uh, I don't know if you could hear that. So it's make a noise. So, so, so if it's something, your core of what your business is, the core things that can enable your strategy for that, um, I would really go and not necessarily go hard as in you have to implement everything in a working environment, but you've got to go hard in at least your investigation of it and your experimenting to try to see that or or even understanding what would be the new scenario of how it would work and planning for it. You could uh, just face the risk of reacting too late um, with this. I think the thing with not going too quickly would be around you know, building every, like starting technology first. I think you need to start problem statement first. Like you go, okay, ChatGPT can do a lot of awesome things. So we have to create something with the awesome functionality it could bring. It must be the other way. Okay, what's the value we want to bring to our clients? And then working together, okay, like how do we make that happen better with I, I, think, the, I, I, I think I think I agree. So what I was trying to say with building too fast is that because the barriers to building at the moment are so low, you can kind of in a no-code environment, you can take almost any business process and say, I'm going to kind of Scooby-Doo wire this together using some process automation tool, a bit of large language model, and you know, maybe I'm going to spend a month, two, three months on every one of these problems. I think concurrently what's happening is for every one of those things that you're doing, organizations are focusing the entire attention on solving those problems. So let me yes. use a specific example. Maybe what we want to automate the process of mining documents. We want to chuck a whole bunch of documents from our organization into a vector and create like an internal oracle. We could spend three months doing that only to discover that a startup in Silicon Valley that sells a product a thousand times better than anything we could have built doing exactly that can vend it out at a lower price. And I just think that one's got to be quite picky about what you, not embracing AI, don't get me wrong, I think we should be embracing AI everywhere we can. The question is more about like, what do you choose to build yourself and what platform do you use to implement and what and how do you kind of react to the ecosystem that's proliferating at this incredible rate now? And that decision is quite hard because, yeah, it's sometimes not entirely clear what's going to be released tomorrow at kind of a low rate and kind of a bettable than you can do internally. But I think your guidance and saying that what you should have a pin sharp focus on is your core offering and that that's where you should sort of potentially plow most of your focus is 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 right. I mean, I think that 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 does make sense. So I agree we have to move. It's it's the question of how and and yeah and and and, 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 and I'm very much with as you said, all the SaaS platforms out there I would say you build the core of your business. That's your RP. Because if you don't have a core that that really you've got, either because the values in your data and the value of the way you do something, then you know you've got a very easily replicable business that you know really is sitting duck. Yeah. But so you usually it doesn't always work out this way. But generally, building the core partner everywhere else, or not necessarily partner. You 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 license and and that on everything else, like with all the different support functions. You're not going to go ahead building at some HR system necessarily. You would get that in. Okay, what is the best that's been developed externally and bring that uh, bring that in. And also the cost of these things are just getting lower and lower and lower. So mm. I would also say review. So some companies have existing technologies and AI that were justifiably expensive in the past that actually now people also aren't aware of the fact that actually no this no longer costs so much this is actually very very easy to accomplish through a different mechanism so 
I think that there needs to be an investigation of existing solutions as well. Yep, completely agree with that. But I'm going to push us along onto another one that I, I thought, and I'd be really keen to hear some of your, else, uh, both of your other do's. But, you know, another one that I think we need to be doing as organizations, and it goes back to the people side of it, is that we need to be showcasing both the wins and the relevance. Because I still think that there is so much, really, if you go into a business right now and talk to people about AI, mostly it's just talk. Mostly it's unsubstantiated. People can't connect it to their actual domains. They don't really know, like, kind of, kind of what it might look like to take a particular process and optimize it. And more importantly, they don't understand how that's relevant to their domains and what they do in their organization. So that was my third do: is that we need to find, we need to be real, we need to be really intentional in the organization about bringing use cases to our people that um, help them understand the advantages and the relevance to their domains, so that they can really see it. I don't think that you can leave that work to everybody to discover themselves. What do you think, Josh? I've, I've taken a lot of the time. Maybe you start and I'll <laughs> take over. No, I think it's, it's uh, no, I agree with that. I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I think the remaining dues that I have on my side are, I think I only have one left, I think, uh, especially given the time. And that's simply, I think it's actually something Dean would, uh, would probably, I think would agree with, and that's with in relation to this data, gov uh, sorry, AI governance. And that's just, as we talked about not being frozen with fear with regard to data privacy and res residency, it doesn't negate the need for some governance framework that prescribes the sort of optimal ways um, regular employees um, uh, uh, and users can, should and uh, uh, should be using these tools, how they should be uh, making reference to when they are using these tools and certain documents uh, otherwise. And so I think it's important to get some sort of draft of a, of a governance framework in, that you can incrementally improve. For sure, and that's very important, Josh. And I think the question I feel like also like that's the thing is not that risk aren't important, but the question needs to be changed instead of can I do this to how can I do this? So not saying like oh am can I do this? Is it safe and that to say that there's clearly huge gains, productivity, effectiveness, etc. from this thing. How can we do it safely? We, to say we're not, there's not a negotiable. It's not if we do this, we have to transform our whole company with this because, and and it's possible to do it. How do we go about doing it? Making sure that the answer is we are doing it, not to try to see can we, can't we, what can we do? So we full on doing this, and they have those the, the support, the the you know the compliance risk, all these support teams, legal, um, you know security, everything to help guide you along the way to sort of say this is. How, how we do it effectively. I feel that too many people are sitting on the other side still. It's like, should we do this? Shouldn't we do this? How could, you know, instead of uh, really understand that you do. And again, what you say is also very important around the talk. So everyone's talking and making it important and, and setting up, for example, AI committees, AI champions, or AI something. But a lot of it's a lot for, for show more than anything else. Just to say, I feel like people are doing that to say, no, we have done something. You And also the thing is that I feel that you have to give that as important a seat at your table at your group executive as everyone else, because you don't want it to be okay. Yeah, the group execs are all meeting. Cool, we got this. We got all different. The head of this person, the head of this, all coming. Oh, okay, um, if we got time, the NAS uh, add-on. Okay, what we're doing in the AI is the separate thing. It has to be as core focus as everything else you're doing, because typically it's it's not different to any other innovation. You always find with companies uh, and less ones that are really serious about innovating is that business as usual takes priority and if you've got time capacity thoughts headspace etc after all of that then this innovation you know we can we can try push it can't be that way it has to be that this is is important and it is important for you i think it's a whole nother uh, episode on like the fact is corporate corporate structures typically don't enable this they p push away from this typically General executives of the companies can do really well with the, and for themselves with doing nothing. Um, so why even risk it by looking at any of this stuff? Um, uh, but it's the long term of the company will suffer because of that. I'm pleased you said that. My third don't was don't fail to dislodge internal inertia. There's more risk than ever before. And we touched on mm -hmm. it earlier, earlier, but I think that this there are, it's just this rate of change is different now. And organizations that don't embrace this are going to get, it's an existential threat. It's an existential threat to businesses that are unable to 
to that. And that's um, that's really going to be a big deal. And, and I feel, and sorry, I'm cognizant of time as well, but I feel like the problem with big, large corporates is different. Smaller businesses are uh, are complete different a kettle of fish, and also businesses where founders are still the executives. Uh, they they're building for the long term. They think about their legacy. They're not. They don't have the option to. Ah, you know what? My business gets disrupted. I'll just go to the next business with their competitor. They, and I'll they, work they're for not, them. They're so not corporate managers who are incentivized not to take risks. In other words. Exactly. So the thing is, like, you have to realize that uh, making your company, you realize that, OK, there's a huge risk for your company, but do the executive, there's not necessarily the huge risk for the career of the executive. So, you, you know, even if the company does fail. So the thing is that really have the incentivized structures to make things happen, make sure that the incentives of executives align with actually chartering it into the long term with this AI focus, because if not, I don't blame them. I, I, I wouldn't want to do something either that could, you know. <laughs> if I was them, you know. Okay, awesome. We've probably got space for one or two more quick ones, and then I've got a parting question for you, Dean. But is there anything else right. that you had that was on that that list that you think you need to get across? Do's and don'ts, or you, Josh? I think I've said what I needed to say. Or maybe I'll phrase it as a don't. Don't think that this is hugely complicated. Actually, the path forward for a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily rocket science. I think the accessibility of being able to do it um, and the ease of being able to to actually win using this is 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 really a lot easier than you would think. So don't be stuck with fear, like we said, because you think that this is such a complicated environment. It's actually, if you've got the right people advising you, then seeing the wood from the trees, it's not such a scary thing to do. It's not uh, scary. It's just it's more easily. Uh, achievable than you would think. I completely agree. I think the even the coding environment has become so abstracted now. The tooling is so accessible. You know, we just need to be clear on what it is that we offer. What is the value? The hardest question here is to refocus on the value that we deliver to our customers and make sure that we don't lose sight of that. I suppose in all of the in all of the distraction. Yes, um, completely. So here's my question. I see that there was a article published earlier this week by one of the DeepMind co-founders. Um, uh, I think it was DeepMind. What do you, I think they're part of Google now. Uh, the guy's name is Shane Legg. And he said that he thinks there's a 50-50 chance that Google are going to achieve artificial general intelligence within the next five years. I thought that was a very provo provocative big statement. Um, just to remind our listeners, artificial general intelligence is once we build machine minds that are capable of human level intellect across a wide domain of different areas. So what's so clever about people is the world bots. What's so amazing about the human brain is it's, it's like a simulator, a model simulator of reality that can predict things it hasn't seen before. It can anticipate what something is by seeing a snippet of it. It can they can extrapolate out into a logical future based on like a very small amount of stimulus. It's almost like a model builder of reality. And what they're saying is that in they reckon we we could be as close as five years away from artificial general intelligence, which some might say is um, the, a, a necessary um, requirement for this thing called the singularity, which is where you get kind of a self a self refining recursive intelligence, which just kind of leads to. Um, almost like a digital god. But what are your thoughts? Five years away, 50-50 chance. Um, people would have said that's a pipe dream 12 months ago. Yeah, so I actually have no a clue, but the people from Google also have no clue. Like, uh, no one's got a clue. You know what I mean? It's, it's the stuff, all the predictions that, that made in certain areas, you see they missed it completely. Like, even the autonomous cars, they missed it completely. But on other things, like things like ChatGPT of that type of thing just came from nowhere and it came in that moment. So I, I really think that is, it's quite hard to tell. And I think that even if it came today, I think uh, people need only worry too much because you've seen now ChatGPT is pretty much a year old and people are now starting to tinker with it and a bit. And that's, you know, so it takes five years. Okay, fine, it takes five years. So 100% we got that in five years. By the time people embrace and realize and it's that, you know, it will take longer than to develop the technology it's, it's, itself. Um, so, and if you think about it, like a lot of the, you like this AI, people like to talk about the singularity and this artificial general intelligence, et cetera. But the thing is like, it's not so much more important than 
the narrow artificial intelligence that we have now, because if you combine all the narrow artificial intelligence, all these separate AI programs anyway, you can pretty much repl replicate most job roles anyway. So you've got that. If you really want to do now build a, you know, take one of Boston Dynamics robots and integrate it with ChatGPT and then integrate it with some other companies' technologies, you've almost got something that's close to artificial general intelligence in a way. But the thing is that, again, you have to go back, like, who cares? Like, it only matters that if there was a thing, now you've got artificial intelligence and you've got this workforce of millions of robots that are now just take it over, it, it will be a lot slower than that if it has to happen. And I think the name of the game is the same. It's like people adapt to anything. If, if it happened today, there's people that adapt and do well and there are people that are not going to adapt. And I think that's maybe one of the most important messages I think for the, someone listening to, is to get things. It's like, okay, it's like, cool. If it comes, great. If it doesn't come, also great. Uh, you know, uh, the people are going to be disrupted by the AI that's there now. Uh, you know, the people that don't move, the people are going to be disrupted by AGI if it ever happens effectively. Are also going to be the people that don't move, you know, and change. I think that's a great perspective. And I think it's an attitude that will, um, yeah, just lead to better results no matter what. Josh, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think I would say I would be personally surprised if you do get AGI in the next five years, but who knows? I think it's, it's uh, I wouldn't have anticipated GPT doing what it can do <laughs> for three, four years ago. So yeah, it, perhaps it's, it is possible. I think I like uh, what Dean said about if it is possible through separate um, individual AIs, then um, yeah, something like an agent-driven um, uh, um, AI, like we talked about in our last podcast, where we have these individual agents that collectively can um, somewhat approximate a sort of a general um, human intelligence. Job time will tell us. Before, there's a famous quote up by some famous person that goes along the lines of the predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about the future. So who knows? We'll see where it all goes. <laughs> Dean, it's I been like a real that. pleasure having you on our pod. Thank you so much for giving so generous so of your time and your contribution. It's been an absolutely fascinating chat. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.